Happy day. Nice to see you. Gospel of Mark, five minutes at a time, minus the reading. <laughs> we are in chapter 8. We're going to begin with verse 27 and move all the way through the chapter. How's that? It's a powerful chapter, actually. It's a real shift. Jesus starts thinking about moving towards the cross, moving towards Jerusalem. And what's on his mind when he shares his... Uh, what it means to be in relationship with God and to, to sort of set one's life uh, within the context of the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. Remember, those two things are synonymous. The kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven are two different ways of saying exactly the same thing. Uh, the, it's God's world. It's where God is in charge. It's where God is, reigns and rules, where God is king, where what God always wants to have happen happens always the way God wants it to happen. The kingdom of God, kingdom of heaven, same place. Anyway, um, our life is in that, buried, ensconced in the kingdom of heaven. So the word I want you to consider today is the word life. Life. Jesus went on with his disciples to the village of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? And they answered him, well, John the Baptist, others, Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. And he asked them, but who do you say that I am? And Peter answered him, you are the Messiah. And he sternly ordered them not to tell anyone about him. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and to be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter, and he said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. And Jesus called the crowd with his disciples, and he said to them, If any of you want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when, it comes, when he comes in the glory of his Father and with holy angels. It's an interesting story, Peter. Uh, they're in Caesarea Philippi. Uh, they're outside of the area where they had been hanging out primarily. It's just a little bit in north of the side of, um, outside of Galilee, in a region controlled by Herod's, Herod Antipas's brother, a gentleman named Philip. And, uh, and he, he asks, who do you think I am? And, and they say, you're the Messiah. But they understand the Messiah within the context of their own frame, not the bigger context that Jesus is talking about. Uh, and so then Peter pulls Jesus aside and he says, um, you know, you can't die. That's not sort of the way the story ends. And Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. Now, just a little side note. Uh, Peter's not Satan, if you hadn't realized that. But what Jesus is indicating here is even friends can call us out of our relationship with God. They can tempt us. Satan uh, in the Old Testament, um, in the book of Job, is the tempter. So Peter tempts Jesus. Uh, to do something that is not within the fulfillment, yesterday, pattern of his life. Uh, because he has come to gauge divine things, not human things, right? Not short-term things, but long-term things. And this is now where we begin to think about life, the word life. We don't want to lose our life for short-term gain in this world. We want to gain our life by short-term loss in this world, right? This is not the thing that the thing is. This is not our, our the, the end-all, be-all, quite the contrary. This is just a little bit of the beginning of what it means to be in eternal relationship with God, right? Each of our souls is linked as a portal to the bigness of God's divinity. And that is the portal we will move through when we die. Jesus moved through it on the cross to come out the other side into this great magnificent space that is life, real life, true life, eternal life. Here's the thing, though, and I do it all the time. I have all of these things that I use to frame my life, my office that I sit in that you're 
having to look at in all these videos. My, my relationship with my beautiful wife and uh, with my children, right? My, the money in the bank that I try to save or the things that I buy or the places I go and the things I do. And sometimes that becomes the essence of my life because I'm forgetting, right? I'm forgetting that there is this uh, true life, right? Jesus calls this generation, Jesus calls this life adulterous and sinful. And what he's saying is adulterous because we're not putting our primary relationship uh, to be in relationship with God, but something else. Sinful because we're turned away from God, right? We haven't turned back to God. We're missing the mark on what is important. And then Jesus says, the Son of Man's going to come. Don't let him be ashamed with your priorities. And live into the glory, right? Try to bind yourself with Jesus. Do it in prayer. Do it in worship, right? Make a commitment and study. That's what Lent's about. That's where we are anyway. And, and, and aim for that, right? We may miss the mark. That's what sin is. But then we, we refocus and we try again. We keep training to have this life because this little temporal thing that we're in, this life, leads to something else. So I invite you today to think about your life, how you define it, what's important to you. And then think more deeply about the eternity, right? Marriage with God, working towards an eternal, targeted dash towards divinity. I'm glad to see you. Thanks for being with me. Peace upon your soul. Amen.